So we're continuing on with our New Testament examples here. Um, let's open a word of prayer before we start though. Father, we just pray, Lord, each time we come to your word, God, reveal it to us, break it open to us. God, that we'll be able to receive food this morning. We need manna, we need fresh bread. Lord, we don't want to eat the stale stuff of yesterday that's rotted out with worms. God, we need your bread for the day. Lord, we thank you for your presence amongst us. God, we thank you for your spirit being here. Lord, that which I say which is not of you, blow it away in the breeze. But God, that which is destined for this morning, that which is in your diary from before the foundation of this earth, Lord, for this day, God, let it be broken open to us, Lord, that we might receive, God, your word. And God, may it be received in good soil, let it bear fruit in our hearts, that the fruit of righteousness, joy and peace will be our portion. And God, we just thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're in book of Acts 12 is what we're doing here. And so the book of Acts, verse 12. Now I did at the start of the series tell you that I would um, I would go through just a, a, the exhaustive list of examples. That was a little ambitious, so we're not doing that. Uh, I have, what we've done is we cover off some of the main ones maybe. And, um, and I've listed the other ones so that you can have a look in your own study to have a look and, and chase those down. Uh, it was some very important things that we've left out, but we just can't, I just feel there's the movement of the Lord to go on to other things. So, um, so we've come to our conclusion today is where we're at. So 12, uh, Acts 12, and we're going verses 1 to 19. Now about the time of Herod the king, stretched out his hand to harass some of the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it was pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping bound with two chains. Sorry, can you put those um, air cons back on, Dale? After two, uh, two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood before him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side, um, and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. So, when he, so he went out and followed him and did not know what was done by the angel was real. But he thought he was seeing a vision. And when he were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened them to its own, of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of the Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, and when they were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. And when she recognized Peter's voice because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but he ran and in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, you're beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. And so they said, it is, it is his angel. Now Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door and they saw him, they were astonished. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared how the, them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he said, go, tell these things to James. And when he went to the brethren, and he departed, and he went to another place. Then as soon as it was day, there was no small, small stir among the soldiers about what had become Peter. But when Herod had searched for him and not found him, he exclaimed the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. Okay. Yeah, we could go on, but we won't. And so uh, we have this story here. Now, I should explain the method here just for these other examples so you know what's going on. What we do is we find out 
where the word occurs. Now, there's no rapture in the Bible, but the word harpazo is to forcibly remove. And that's how we come to these examples. You simply find that word in Greek. Search for that word, and every time you see that word is an example of what's going to happen in the rapture at the end times. So it's not rocket science. I'm no guru here. We just search that word, we find that word, and we do our research from that, and we see whether or not it fits the explicit text, the example, and if not, we leave it alone. But I'm telling you, every time you see that word, it tells you something about the rapture. And so we've gone through there. We see the timing of the Antichrist in this passage from where we start, the, the verses that we've read. Because Herod accepts worship as a god is what happens, which is exactly what the Antichrist is going to do, okay? And so we have here in Acts 12, 21, and upon a set day... Uh, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and made an oration to them and the people gave a shout saying it's the voice of a god and not of a man. Now someone says that to you, you immediately correct them. Herod however says my goodness my marketing campaign has worked. You know what I mean? And he receives it but immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave God the glory and was eaten of worms and died. A picture of what's going to happen to the antichrist and the false prophet uh, and the devil eventually. Okay, so here we go. Timing of the Antichrist also. Before that, we see that Herod brings a false peace to the Middle East. Herod, of course, the Herod the Great, the initial one, is a picture of the Antichrist, and so we see that uh, and some clues there as to the identity of the Antichrist in the uh, identity of Herod being uh, of Roman, uh, accepted by the Romans, Idiomaean or an Edomite, and also accepted religiously by the Jews. And so he's a, all things to all men, he's going to do that same thing. But anyway, we have this false priest, peace to the Middle East. And people will only be fed by the king's authority, as it was in Herod's time. And so, and Herod was highly displeased with them in Tyre and Sidon. But they came with one accord, and having made Blastus the king's chamberlain, they friend desired peace. And so they figure Herod's the man to give him peace. And also the country, was fed by the, uh, the country was fed by the king's country. And so we are going to have the same thing with the mark of the beast is going to be the means by which we're going to have those things think. Because Revelation 13, 15, he has the power to give life to the image of the beast. The image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. <coughs> and he causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man may buy or sell except that he had that mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. It's the, probably the best known verse by unbelievers in the Bible. They all know about this sort of thing. Okay, we also know from our example as we replay the themes that we've already seen that persecution comes first. Okay, the first verse about that time, King Herod stretched forth his hands to persecute certain of the church and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. They were the days of the unleavened bread. Okay, we'll go into that. Jesus, this is replaying Christ as what's going on there. Jesus was persecuted to placate the Jews, to please the Jews in the same way. This occurred at the time of the Passover. The very next verse, verse 4 in there, <coughs> tells you that Herod was planning to parade him after the Passover and so this is the time of the Passover so we're playing exactly what Jesus did Jesus evaded the Roman guards by means of divine intervention Peter evades guards by divine intervention we will evade the Antichrist and his guards by divine intervention okay after the initial appearance he departs to another place and instructs others that he's alive and well same as Jesus did we see the characters getting replayed in these examples persecution comes first, first and also persecuting uh, certain uh, of the church but also it's initiated by King Herod so persecution is going to get tough but I tell you what it's going to get tougher when the Antichrist gets on the scene Herod is going to initiate this uh, persecution right uh, also we've got the killing of church leaders James here getting killed okay and so um, we don't only have persecution but we have the death of some of these church leaders also believing Jews were persecuted on the basis of pleasing unbelieving Jews remember Herod's initiation of these persecutions he saw that it pleased the Jews and so we have believing Jews we have unbelieving Jews so it pleased the Jews is what we're looking at here and that's where it also mentions is, uh, number four. must be the next verse after that it mentions the Passover anyway 
And of course, this echoes of the wise and foolish virgins, virgins, which I can't remember whether we covered off or not. We probably haven't. But it does tell you about the apostate church. There will be believing church members and unbelieving church members. It will replay what happened in Hitler's Germany, where you know, Jews who want to be associated with the, estate, with the state or preserve themselves, say in the Warsaw ghettos and things like that, they still wore the Star of David, they were a Jew abstentionally, did all the rituals, but they served the Germans, okay? They were the ones that loaded the carts and sent them off to the concentration camps and things along those lines. They became administrators to get favour from them, but they betrayed their own people, and we will see that again. The church, you think there was, um, you're going to have these lovely church people, they're going to be great? I tell you what, if you're going to stand in that day, you will be persecuted. You will be put in by those people, okay? So be careful as those days approach. Rescue, of course, as is the theme of all our examples, comes at night and with a believer sleeping. It's interesting when we look at the, uh, the story, the parable of the wise and foolish virgins, we have the same thing happening, okay, and Period would have brought him forth the same night. Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with chains, etc., and the angel of the Lord came upon him. So he comes at night when Peter's sleeping. We look at the parable, and the frightening thing here is that both the wise and the foolish virgins were sleeping when the Lord comes in the middle of the night. Okay, so it's not just we, we look at the church and we say, oh, they're asleep. <coughs> they don't hear any of this. They don't know anything about end times. They're sleeping. They're slumbering. My worry is what's happening to the real? Those that are even wise at the end, they're sleeping. You know what I mean? As is Peter here, okay? Having known about the persecution of the church, the killing of James, he's chained up for all abstensive purposes. He thinks his fate will be the same, is what he's thinking. But he's sleeping in the midst of that. What great peace the Lord has, eh? What great peace the Lord has uh, the day before he was to be killed. Okay, so we also have those. Also, Song of Solomon is consistent with all the other idioms that we covered, the Song of Solomon. They're all sleeping in the night. The bridegroom comes, knocks on the door. The wise woman responds. The unwise says, come back. I've already done all my business, you know? Wait until tomorrow. Here we go. We've also, of course, got rescued by angelic agency. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel. In my Bible, it has a capital H on that. Uh, and has delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all expectation of the Jewish people. So what I look at this, I look at this. Okay, it's angelic deliverance. Yes, it is. When does it come, though? It comes at the most desperate hour. It comes, the previous, they got the death of James. It comes in the middle of the night. All idioms for tribulation, okay? But it comes at the most difficult time. Where is Peter? He's chained to two soldiers on either side. He's gone, mate. He's in captivity. He's awaiting his result of his uh, trial, which will be a kangaroo court, I'm sure. And he's waiting his fate in between this desperate condition. But that's precisely the time when Jesus comes at a desperate time. Also, just to cover off on some people, because some people are saying it's a spiritual rapture, all the rapture's going to, it's just going to be a, a spiritual thing, there's no physical occurrence here. Well, this is also an aspect that's addressed in this example, because in here we've got Peter knocks at the door of the gate when he's out of prison, and she's opened not the gate, because Peter stood at the gate and they said to her, you're mad, but she continued to affirm, no, they, were, they said it's his angel. Well, it's just a, you're having a spiritual experience. It's Peter in his spirit that's here. But no, it was actually Peter. He had to stand there and keep knocking. How's the stupid story in the Bible? It isn't really. They should be rejoicing. Here's Peter. And they're saying, you're a twit rotor. This It's just his angel, you know? Anyway, so he stands at the door. And they opened the door and they saw him. So it's not merely, merely a spiritual rescue. We're talking about a physical thing. Thank God for that. My body's falling to bits. I'm sick of it, you know what I mean? So we need, uh, I'm looking forward to a revamp, you know what I mean? An upgrade, a renovation. So gates open by themselves. This is also considered followed immediately by judgment upon unbelieving Jews. This is the, the example that we're looking at. And so we have the gates, of course, the iron gates, opened of their own accord, just as Noah's uh, gate shut by its own accord. God shut the gate. So we have consistency in these things. It opens up, but immediately the Lord sent his angel and he has delivered me uh, from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And so the expectation of the Jews, we're going to kill this guy. 
He's causing all religious disturbance. We're going to kill him. We're going to regain our status as being the only authority here in this Jewish religion. And so we're, we, they're threatening that. We're going to kill him. And every expectation is gone after that. Okay. In Revelation 3.7, we see to the church of Philadelphia the same echo of what's gone on there. Speaking of the same things, it says, I've set before you an open door that no man can shut. This is a recurring theme. Remember we did the seven churches. This is the, one of the churches of which, you know, there's nothing bad said. It's a beautiful church, okay? The brother, well, everyone wants to be the church of brotherly love. So we assume that's the church that's going to be raptured, at least one of them. And before that, there's an open door, just the same thing that's an example, just the same thing that's, uh, you know, the same thing in Lot's example, same thing in Noah's example, these things are occurring uh, there. But also the next one, it's no coincidence that two verses down from that in verse 9, it says, I will make them that are the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews that are not. So we have the same dichotomy going on. They are of a religious background, but they're not a Jew. Okay, they say they're a Christian, but they're not a Christian. You know what I mean? Their behavior tells you they're not. We have this same thing going on at the same time. So, Also, after the rescue, Herod becomes frantic, wouldn't you? It's unusual, okay, uh, that that occurs. And so there's no small stir among the soldiers. I imagine there's not. Can you imagine if someone just miraculously disappeared from Etna? You know, uh, a terrorist, they would have called him, you know, and then he disappears miraculously out of there when he's chained between two soldiers and he's gone. And Herod sought him, but he found him not. So he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. And so the same thing's going to happen. Herod, a picture of the Antichrist, after we have the uh, Hapazzo, after the rapture of the church, he will be frantic. Why will he be frantic? Because he knows then his time is short. Okay, so what does he start doing? He starts decimating even his own. It's a picture, of course, of Revelation 12 with the man-child. He goes after, he becomes frantic in this thing. And so not only you end up with chaos is what you have. Okay, it's quick, okay? But we need to be careful here about quick. Okay, so it says here, the angel, of course, it says here, arise up quickly. Okay, he doesn't say, just take your time, Pete. We've got, you know, we've probably got another four hours for daylight. It's okay, you just, you know, do what you need to do. Rub your feet, they'll be tingling because of in the chains. No, he says, smote him on the side. He said, get up, come quickly. The chains fell off. And of course, Revelation 3.11 says, Behold, I am coming quickly. But a lot of confusion on this text because uh, some people will say this, Oh, Paul, the doctrine of imminency, and I think we covered that off. You know, behold, he's coming quickly, and this is, you know, in expectation every minute of the day. Um, well, we are, but because our life could be over at any time, so we will meet the Lord at any time. But the sense in which he's coming quickly is this. If I said to you the train is coming quickly, it doesn't mean that it'll be here in 10 minutes. It may mean, Matthew, step away from the platform because when the train comes in, it comes in quick. You better be ready to get on and then, get, and then it's going quick. You know what I mean? So what we're going to see is a, a domino effect, like consistent with the labor pains, things along those lines. If the waters break, ha, 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 it goes up, a few squeezes, comes off, all good. But by the end, you know what I mean? We're into it. And same thing here. Behold, I'm coming quickly. So when it happens, it'll be like the lightning. It'll be seen from the east to the west. Bang, you know what I mean? I used to have a view like this. I used to think, oh, maybe Jesus is coming slowly and that's what's going to be the terror of the world. You know what I mean? That as he comes quickly, they're going to be terrified. That's why I used to hold that view, but it's not that view. It's behold, I'm coming quickly. Bang, it happens. Okay, right? The twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed, is what will happen to us. Okay. There's another one, Acts 27. Now, I'm not going to go through this completely because I have preached a full sermon on this before in more depth than what I'm going to cover off today because there are a couple of issues at the end that I want to go through. Um, just some final thoughts. But So Acts 27 is Paul's shipwreck. I'd encourage you, if you want to have a look at that tape that we've got on or on the, on the website. Anyway, so Acts 27. But... Same consistent themes. I know I'm boring you to death, but it's the same event, so you have the same pictures going on here. So before the shipwreck, there are trials from Agrippa, Festus, and Felix, okay? So Paul, before he gets on the boat in these turbulent waters, before he gets there, he's got these trials that are going on. So we have persecution happening beforehand, 
And of course, it's a fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy in Luke 21. They lay hands on you and persecute you, delivering up to the synagogues, the churches, and into prisons, and you'll be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Okay? And then it goes on, it shall be turned out for you for a testimony. This is God's way of witnessing, his final witness to these guys, okay? Settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate beforehand what you shall answer. For I'll give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to contradict nor resist. And you shall be betrayed both by parents and by brothers and kinsfolk and friends. That'll test out your love of Jesus right there, your forgiveness, eh? And some of you, they, uh, you shall they cause to be put to death. And you shall be hated by all men for my name's sake. Okay? We don't want to be hated by all men for our sake, for the things we've done. But if we're going to be hated, we want to be hated for his sake. So this is the sort of time that Jesus is saying. We're going to be betrayed. People are going to deliver us up. They're going to put you in front of councils. They're going to put you in front of rulers, kings. So it's no, we shouldn't be shocked. That's, that fits all the examples. Okay, there may be allusions to Noah here. Of course, we're looking at the boat scenario. Paul in the boat. This is his journey, okay? Uh, so being saved in another boat is what we're looking at. So ships are indicative of the church, just to give you some idea where we look at that. If from an evangelistic point of view, you'll see in Luke 5, Simon answering says, Teacher, we've toiled all night. We've taken nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I'll let down your net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fish, and their net broke, and they beckoned unto their partners who were in the other ship that they should come and help them, and they came and filled them both of the ships, and so both began to sink. What we're saying here is when there's revival, it's not about filling one church. You have other boats that come and pick up because the nets are breaking because of the amount of fish that's coming in. So we don't try and do everything on our own. We're a part of a body, you know what I mean? God is able to move that way. And so we say that. So the boat is an allusion to the church, and obviously Noah's dimensions of the ark, etc., show that. Okay, what's the weather like? It turns stormy and gets wet, it gets worse, with intervals, okay? There's little breaks in it, but it gets worse. So it starts off in Acts chapter 4 pretty early on. The winds are contrary. Be sensitive to the fact that winds... The name for wind is Ruach, okay, which is the spirit. We have a, um, an age now where it's a contrary spirit to, our, to Christianity is what we have. The winds are against us. There was a time where there was a blowing, is that right? And all the missionaries going out from the London Missionary Society and the German Missionary Society and the Dutch Missionary Society and the wind was behind it and it was spreading like wildfire. Try sailing your boat today and see what happens. The winds are contrary is what's going on. Okay, but not only were they contrary, but in verse 9, it gets now much more dangerous. So the winds are getting worse. Okay, you have a little lull. They harbour for a bit, all good. That sun comes out, it's good. Then they come out of the harbour. As soon as they come out of the harbour, what happened? We're off again. It's the labour pains. Oh, thank God that's over. Woo, woo. Let's go home. Oh. You know what I mean? No one's going anywhere. Anyway. Okay, the loss of temporary things, including the ship, and a disbelief of prophecy. That's what I'm saying to you. Don't get too attached to all your things. Because, verse 10, And they said to him, Sirs, I perceive this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the cargo and ship, but also of our lives. So some will die, some will perish. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the captain and the owner of the ship more than those things that were spoken with. Paul says, hey, if you just listen, we can save the situation here. The ship doesn't have to perish. And what is the what's the captain of the ship say? Forget about that. I'm listening. I've got my horoscope here and it's telling me this is my lucky month and the weather will be good for me. Good things are going to happen. You know, Paul's saying, I've got a prophecy here. And they say, oh no, it'll be like every other time. We don't need to worry about the things of Jesus coming back. Don't worry about that. We don't believe in prophecy. We're going to believe we're looking and it looks good from where we're at. That's where they're going to be. But the voyage is going to be destruction of the ship, destruction of your cargo, okay? With all the things that are on there. You think these are good? I love these things. They may be taken away at some stage. Okay, despite desperate efforts to save the ship, spiritual forces will overwhelm it. Understand we're in a battle right now. Satan wants the woman. Okay? 
Israel. But I said also, Satan hates the church, the bride of Christ, okay? So there's a battle to corrupt the woman. He wants to lure the woman. He wants to defile the woman is what he wants to do. There's a battle going right now for the bride of Christ. And, but eventually what happens is they try, things get so bad on this voyage that they use helps undergirding the ship and they fear lest it shall fall into quick strand, they struck sail and they were driven. Eventually the church is not redeemable as a corporate entity, I'm saying. The spirit will be driven, they'll be driven by the spirit of this age so much that it'll just be carried, you know what I mean? The ship is no longer going to be driven as in we, we've got a rudder and we set our course for the morning star, you know what I mean? We're not going to be looking at that. The ship will simply be driven and dangerously onto the rocks is what we're looking at. Okay, now despite abandoning the cargo, right, they get rid of all their worldly goods. You can think of it and you look at it for the Holocaust situation, goods getting confiscated, houses out, ransacked, living homeless, rounded up. What happens after that happens? The sun, the moon and the stars are not seen for many days is what happens in this example. Acts 27, 18, and we're being exceedingly tossed with a tempest. The next day they lighten the ship, that's throwing all your worldly goods away. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship, everything, lightening it so it doesn't crash, trying to anyway. And when neither the sun nor stars in many days appeared and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. Same examples that we had last time where we have the hopelessness. We do have, we must keep the hope within us. But things look so bad that it, but if not, remember the, the Nebuchadnezzar example, we know our God can deliver us, but if not, and these guys are the same way, they're saying, hey, all hope was taken away. We were looking and we're saying, this is so desperate, what's happening? Of course, Joel is a fulfillment of Joel chapter 2. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. So this is not the day of the Lord. This is the seals where this stuff is breaking. Okay, and it shall come to pass that whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion, Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord said, and, the, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Remember this, God will deliver. God's hand never turns up when you want him to but he will deliver. I wish I could book him in. I need you at four o'clock. You know what I mean? But I guarantee you he won't turn up at four. It'll be the minute before midnight when you've just about abandoned all hope, when you thought all is lost. Why is that? Because who gets the glory in that instance? When every other measure has been exhausted, it's all for Jesus. Okay. And also this is consistent, of course, with the explicit text. Because Matthew 24, where we're talking about these things, Jesus himself says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give its light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Is this before or after Jesus comes? Because the next verse reads like this, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming. He hasn't come before these days. These days are before the coming. And the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with great sound of a trumpet. So the trumpet blast hasn't occurred when this all happens. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds. That's when it's happening, Jesus tells you. So this stuff is before, and this is when he gathers. Unless you think between verse 29, verse 29 and 30... There's some gap theory in there. But otherwise, I think Jesus is fairly been trying to be plain here. Okay, spiritual famine and preparation for the rescue by angelic intervention. Same thing that's going on in every example. Okay, Acts 27, And when they had long been without food, then Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you have, should have hearkened to me and have not set sail from Crete and have gotten this injury and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of God, whose I am and whom I also serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must stand before Caesar. We don't have time to go in that, but that phrase there is a picture of 
um, having to stand before the Antichrist there, so we'll see the judgment. And lo, God hath granted with thee all of them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe that uh, believe God that it shall be even so as it has been spoken unto me. But we must be cast upon a certain island. So we have long without food. Of course, it's a fulfillment of Amos 8, chapter um, 11, saying um, uh, there will be a famine, or not of wheat or grain, but a famine of the word of God. This book is going to get banned. The, the reading of this book will be banned, or passages in it will be banned, or it'll be uh, cut into pieces so that you get acceptable version. Even now, there's a man in jail in, in the UK for reading Romans chapter 1 uh, regarding homosexuality. And so that is obviously a banned section of the book. You can read it in your own time, but you can't publicly proclaim it, which is what he did, and he ended up in jail for doing that. So, um, However, I imagine you can read the Quran and all sorts of things in there if you want to. Right? Um, okay, false Christians <laughs> under false pretenses will seek to fall away from the boat. What happens in this example? Okay, and as the sailors, so they're in the ship, they're on the boat, but what are these sailors trying to do? Are they trying to save the ship or are they trying to save the boat? No, they're saying the sailors were seeking to flee out of the ship. They don't want to get, get knocked around on this boat. They want to get off the boat. And they lower the boat into the sea, their own new little church they've got, they lower that into the sea under colour as though they would lay out anchors for the foreship. So it's like, oh, we're going to do a service for the church. We're going to do something for the boat. We're going to lay these anchors out. But what's their real intention? Get off the boat. We're going to have our own boat, which is much safer than your boat. And so uh, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, except they abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. You must stay on the boat until such time as the boat is wrecked and then you get off, okay? But we stay on. If you, don't, if, you, if you get off the boat before Jesus lifts you off the boat, you're not going to be saved, okay? All right. There's also, as consistent with other examples, there's a final feeding prior to the rescue. We're not left to our own devices. So in Acts 27, 33, while the day was coming on, the day, of course, is the sun of righteousness, S-O-N, the rising of the sun, Okay, we, we have the same thing going on, our resurrection in there as well. Paul besought them all to take some food. So prior to the day, just as the day's coming on, then they take some food, saying this, the day is the 14th day. You don't have time to go into that. You need to look at the other tape. That we wait and continue fasting. So they've been fasting, no food, but now they get fed, having taken nothing. Wherefore, I beseech you to take some food, for this is for your safety. You either, you've got to eat. If you don't eat... You're not saved. It's going to be perilous for you. You've got to eat the food to be saved, okay? You need the strength of that food. For there shall not a hair perish on the head of you. But when he had said this and had taken bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer and themselves also took food. And we were all in, in all in the ship, 200, three score and 16. You can go into that as well. And when they had eaten enough, they lighten the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. Many pictures in here that we don't have time to go into. Simply to say this, that we must eat this food to be saved. There's a final feeding. What does it replay? We've got the Passover. They also had to have the Passover meal to be saved. You, you could be as good a Jew as you want. You didn't eat the meal, you're not saved. Okay? You didn't put the blood on the lintel post that obviously came from the, the lamb that was killed, then you're not saved. Also replays Lot. They did the same thing. They had unleavened bread and a feed before they left. And of course, Jesus tells us in his Olivet Discourse the same thing. In this gospel, the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a testimony unto all the nations, the final feeding, and then the end shall come. We've got to eat of the words of Jesus all the way up, okay, to get our strength, to keep our strength. We don't eat, we get weak, and we'll fall. So those that are not strong, churches that are not strong, they're going to fall. People that are weak, baby Christians, if they don't eat, you're going to fall away. You know what I mean? You don't have the strength to hold on. And of course, then we have the wheat that's cast into the sea here. What's going on? Jesus, of course, before he's coming, will do a final warning. And so what's going to happen is this, there's going to be a final preaching of the word. Things are perilous, but the wheat is going to get cast into the sea. The sea, of course, is a picture of the nations. And so there's going to be, whether it's not the two witnesses, whatever it is, 
Maybe the church of God, depending on where your timing is and all that sort of stuff, but this wheat is going to get cast into the sea. And of course it's a replay of Ecclesiastes 11, which says, cast your bread upon the water and in many days it'll come back to you. Because we're going to do that in the sea, and then after Jesus comes back, the waters are going to cover the earth, just as the knowledge of the Lord. Yeah. You understand the analogy we're talking about there? Okay. Only a personal rescue is possible. Okay? In all of the examples, it's not a corporate entity that gets saved. It's individuals. I don't want to read through all that. But it says, But the centurion designed to save Paul stayed them from their purpose and commanded that they could, who, those who could swim should cast themselves overboard and get to the land. The rest on some planks and some on other things from the ship, and so it came to pass they all escaped safe to the land. There comes a time when the ministry ceases, consistent with the other examples that we went through. Okay, Paul, up to this point, is saying, listen, I've got the word of the Lord here. You should listen to me. We're going to, for the safety of the ship, we do this. Here, rise, time to eat, time to not eat. We're going to fast for 14 days. Now's the time to eat. Okay, lighten the ship, cast everything off. Paul's in control. He's a prisoner, but he's in control. The captain's listening. Oh, okay, we'll do that, you know. But there comes a time where the ministry goes and you simply swim for your life, trying to make it to the shore. Remember what I said to you about Peter in the boat, okay, with his cloak when he sees Jesus on the shore, okay? The time comes, he just puts the garment of salvation. The mantle goes off, the ministry's off. You simply put the garment of salvation on and swim for your life. So it's individuals that will be raptured, okay? We're not looking for a, an institution to go. It'll be individuals in there that have prepared themselves, okay? Or been prepared by the Lord, I should say. After the re rescue, of course, judgment swiftly follows, okay? When they were escaped, of course, they went to Malta, and the barbarians showed us no common, no common kindness, okay? So after here, after we escape, Man, we're going to get shown uncommon kindness. Who's looking forward to that? At the hands of the Lord. The scripture says this, Eye has not seen, nor ear has heard, what God has prepared for those who love him. Hallelujah, I say. You think you found something good here? Well, multiply that, because what's it going to be like in heaven? Well, in something, Jesus has been up there for 2,000 years, getting a mansion ready. How's that? That'll be fantastic. Well, I mean, he made the earth in seven days. What's he been doing for 2,000 years? You know what I mean? Who knows? All right. So we've got, uh, and they kindled a fire and received a sword because of the present rain. And because of the, that's the outpouring we're talking about. But anyway, we'll go on. Because of the cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out by reason of the heat and fastened on his hand. When the barbarians saw the venomous creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man's a murderer, whom though he hath escaped from the sea, Yet justice has not suffered to live. Howbeit he shook off the creature into the fire and took no harm. But they expected that he would have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But when they were long in expectation and beheld nothing amiss came to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a God, a God. And when we see him, we should be like him. You know what I mean? We're not going to be greater than him. We're not going to be equal to him, but we will be like him, okay? So I don't want to be misconstrued on that one. After the rescue judgment goes, why is that? Because the picture of Paul shaking off this serpent in the fire, of course, is the picture of Revelation 20. In the back of the book, he laid hold of the dragon, the old serpent, which is called the devil. And what happened? Bound him a thousand years, but in couple of verses down, he's cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. So we have the same replay of the timeline. When's the devil going to go? Well, the rescues happen first, then happens after that. So we have a, a timeline on that. Let's go through the other rescues. I told you I don't want to bore the living daylights out of you going through example after example because the themes are similar in all these examples. But and it's different aspects are shown in there. So I'll, I'll put them up here. You can have a look in your own time. Apply the same rationales to these examples and you'll see the picture come clear. Okay, here it goes. Uh, the first one is Philip's rapture in Acts 8. Okay, so remember the first guy getting saved is an African eunuch. And then the translation occurs, so that'll teach you something about that and our new bodies and things. We've also got Paul's rapture in 2 Corinthians 12, chapter 2, where he's caught up into the, the third heaven, etc., and all this sort of stuff. 
John's rapture in Revelation 4, where he actually comes up and sees the whole book here. You know what I'm saying? So that is also a picture. We've also got a major one that we haven't probably covered off properly is the transfiguration in Matthew 17, 11, 13. You must have a look at that. Okay, that is a, that is a picture uh, also that cannot be missed. I'll say this. These are two books that I think you should read annually. Uh, Although, I have to be clear here, when I started this series, I thought, I'll read this book, Harpezo, but I'm such a slow reader that I haven't read it. Okay? <laughs> this one I read, and I said, um, it's, that's a book I've got to read every year. I've started reading this one, but I got ahead of myself, and you know what I mean? I just, it's sitting beside my bed somewhere, with a marker in it. So I no doubt I've differed from Jacob Prash in some areas. Um, if I have, I say go with Jacob. He is a much more learned man than I am. I'm not sure where I differ from him because I haven't read the book. Uh, but I would say these are two books that you would invest in and they would be a great blessing to you in the coming years. So they would definitely be done. Okay, other thoughts? Ecclesiastes 1.9, which we have done before, it says, that which has been done is what shall be, and that which has been, has been is that which shall be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new? Well, there is, you know. There was nothing prior to Jesus coming. And then when we had the new birth, he made a new creation in us. The creation started again. God rested on the seventh day and didn't start again until the new creation came. What a great thing God's done for us. You know what I mean? Back at work he is. Anyway, so here we go. And there's a new thing. Uh, it has been long ago, but having said that, the, the, the second creation, born again, is just a replay of the first creation. You know what I mean? That was, has happened to us. So it's been long ago and the ages were before us. So that which has been is that which will be. Okay, then also... Isaiah 46, remember the former things of old, for I am God, there's none else. I am God and there's none like me. God differs himself from every other God on the planet in this way. He says, I declare the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Okay, now on this, I've got to tell you and I want to put a caveat up front. I've never ever heard anyone preach this, what I'm about to show you. So it's simply my concoction. However, when I look at it, it seems obvious to me as to what's going on. Okay? But I want to put it out there. I have never heard anybody preach on it. And so it may be complete garbage. All right? So I'll just say that out there. Do your own work on it. Have a look at it. See what you think. It seems to make sense to me. We've got the original creation. He's Remember God saying, from, um, I'm telling you from the beginning, the, the end. And this is how he differentiates himself. Well, in day one of Genesis, we have the heaven and earth and divided light from darkness is what's happened. Day two, we have a firmament, or he puts the heaven to divide the waters above from the waters beneath. Then we have day three, where dry land appears and divides the waters, and we have grass and herbs, fruit trees after their own kind. Then we have day four, where the sun and moon to divide the light from darkness and to rule over the day and the night, is what we've got going on. Day five, we've got waters, living creatures, and great sea creatures is what we've got going on. Day six, we've got cattle, creeping things, beasts on the earth, Man in our image and food given is what we've got. And of course, day seven, which we've just said, God rested and sanctified it and there was peace. But what you see in scripture so many times is on the, when we read from the beginning of Genesis, God works this way. And when we get to the back of the book, if you want to see my sermon called The Restoration of All Things, you see that God then works backwards to where he started. And we see the same thing replaying in the first seven days, we see it replayed backwards from the seven that occurs at the end. Okay, let's have a look. Revelation 6, and I saw, behold, a white horse, and he that sat on a crown was given to him. And what's the white horse? He comes with a covenant of peace, is what he's got, okay? And as it says in Daniel 8, 25, through his cunning, he shall also cause deceit to prosper, and his hand, and she shall magnify himself, his heart, and without warning shall destroy many. So he's going to, through peace, destroy many, is what he's going to do. Okay? But it's the first seal that's broken. 
This is the first sign of the coming. He's working backwards. So God finishes with peace, God resting, and Satan starts his campaign with peace, but a false peace that destroys many. Okay, then we have in day six, where we have the uh, beasts of the earth, man in our image and food given, and then first went Revelation 16. Not that Revelation is chronological, but there are parts that run chronologically, so you will see this back end running chronologically here. So, and I saw, uh, it says, and the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and there fell foul and evil sores upon men who had the mark of the beast, the beast of the earth, okay? And upon them that worshipped his image. God makes man in his image on the sixth day. Satan then makes a beast, an image in the image of man, 666, the number of man. He makes the ultimate man's image, but it's an image of Satan. So he then reforms and replays the steps here. Then we have day five with waters, living creatures, and great sea creatures. And he said to me, the waters which you saw... And we just discussed that, the waters, we know from the Psalms, where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations and tongues. We don't need to interpret that. So the waters are nations. But what's in this nations? He sees a beast on this, on this thing, okay? And they'll hate the harlot, she'll make her desolate. What's it? It's a beast that's coming out of the sea. A great sea creature is coming out. Okay, same thing getting replayed. Then we have day four, the sun and the moon to divide the light from darkness to rule over the day and the night. And in here, the, the light of the lamp in Revelation 18, okay? Uh, 23, and the light of the lamp shall shine no more at all in you and the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more at all in you. You're not going to hear not only the, the bride, but the book will be banned. The voice of the bridegroom, gone, okay, at this point. Why? For all your merchants and all the great men of the earth and your sorcerers were all nations deceived. And in here was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and all that were slain upon the earth. And we spoke to you before about the moon turning to blood, what that represents, the killing of the, the saints, just what they're saying here. It's the same day that the sun and the moon are done and, it, and there's going to be a division of darkness and light here in amongst all that. Okay. Then we've got day three where the dry land appears. What's going on with dry land? Well, it's, if you look at the tape restoration of all things, the dry land is, of course, Israel. But what comes out of the dry land? Isaiah 53, 2, He shall grow up before him, speaking of Jesus, as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. This is the appearance of Jesus, the first thing, a prophecy, that he'll be a root out of dry ground, and therefore I don't think it's a coincidence that the dry land appears here. Jesus will appear at this point. Okay, we're going to have the, the appearance the first time. The dry land appears, I think Jesus appears. The root of Jesse, the son of David. Okay, then we have the firmament to divide the waters above from the waters beneath. And of course... The waters above and the waters beneath can be angelic beings and things like those, but needless to say, there's a division of angelic beings. Jesus comes back, we become heavenly, is what we do, okay? We become the nations, tribes, and tongues of heaven that are going to be singing praises to him and glorifying his name in heaven. We're going to be up there, but what's happening on the opposite side of things? Jesus is sticking them down. You know, there's a division between the waters, and in between that is heaven, is what's happening. There's a great divide between the waters below and the waters above, and the division is the firmament, the heaven, okay? We have the same thing dividing. Of course, last but not least, but the most obvious piece in the puzzle, is we have first the creation of the first heaven and earth, and we replay backwards the new heaven and earth being created. So it needs to replay backwards. I see. But it might be complete rubbish, you know what I mean? Like I say, I haven't heard anyone preach that, so I have no idea, but something to think about, you know, and have an investigation on. Okay, we're just about at the end. The thing that got me thinking along these lines in the first place was Psalm 23. And I, I still keep it as a, as a comfort for this side of things, because I think Psalm 23 pretty much outlines this whole process. 
uh, that we're looking at. And of course we know it, but let's read it. It says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul and he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That, the, those group of verses there could be construed to be the last, uh, either the first part of the church's history or up until now. Then it changes course. It says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. We went through the scriptures. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Okay? We're not left to our own devices here. Why? Because your rod of correction and your staff, that is your support when you can't walk properly, you use a rod and a staff, they comfort me. We're walking through this process, but we're not to fear evil. Why? Because Jesus is going to be there with us. Not only that, we think of the marriage supper of the land when we read this next portion. So we're going through it. You prepare a table before me. Where though? In the presence of my enemies. Okay? And you anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. And once we're with Jesus, what happens then? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is the picture that the Lord gives us to comfort us through this process. I believe. I believe. Because all of us can say here, has goodness followed you all your life? Mercy has. I've had some really non-good experiences if you want to be polite. Exactly, mate. But the mercy of God has been there through that period. But there'll be a time where every tear will be wiped away. A time of restoration, of redemption, where the shame of our walk will be gone, where the sins of the past will go. We too will have our time <laughs> where that will be wiped and washed and we will remember it no more. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to end this whole thing with a prayer that renounces fear because the great trap of this whole thing is when you see it, great fear grips your heart. It comes upon you. It says in Luke 21, 26, people are going to have heart attacks for fear. Why? And for looking towards those things which are coming on the earth. It's not just your normal things of life, although people have died literally of broken hearts. The pressures of life did them in. But this is specifically when you look at the things that are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken and men's hearts are going to fear, fail them for fear. But God doesn't give us a spirit of fear. And surely this will be in the seven trumpets is what happens here. Men's hearts will fail them because it will be terrifying. They're going to seek death but it's going to flee from them, you know what I mean? But for us who believers, the great trap is to fall into great fear when we see the things that the government is doing, when we see the terror and the stick that they hold and what they can wield in our direction, is that fear grips us. But God doesn't give us a spirit of fear. It's of love and of power and a sound mind, okay? You get it in the picture of Peter that we did today facing certain death. I mean, who's been rescued by an angel? It's, the statistics are pretty low. You know what I mean? He's thinking, James is dead, the church is persecuted, I'm chained between two of these guys, I'm gone. But he's got the peace of the Lord upon him, and we must need the same things in these times. So I want to stand, if everyone could stand, and I want us to repeat these words together. Okay? as a prayer of our heart. All right? Everyone stand, and we're going to repeat these words. Okay, let's say it together. Father, help me to agree with you that I am not subject to fear, but I am a child of your love. I reject the fear of the future, for I believe that the future is in your hands. I reject the fear of evildoers, for your word says, 
Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, yet I will be confident. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. I renounce the fear of rejection. For David wrote in your holy word, For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Hallelujah. I renounce the fear of witnessing about Christ, because as your word warns, the fear of man brings a snare. Therefore, I choose to fear you more than I do any human being. I affirm the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Hallelujah. I renounce the fear of losing my property and possessions. For your word says, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I renounce the fear of Satan, for your word says he has already been conquered by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. I renounce the fear of saying goodbye to a terminally ill loved one, for Jesus promised, let not your heart be troubled. In my Father's house are many rooms. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. I'll see you again one day, Dad. Hallelujah. I renounce the fear of death, for I affirm with the Apostle Paul, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Hallelujah. Thank you for the promise. Death is swallowed up in victory. I renounce the fear of martyrdom, for your word declares, do not fear those who are able to kill the body, but fear him, rather, who is able to destroy both the soul and body in hell. I renounce the fear of loneliness, for we are promised our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And also, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And again, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled neither let them be afraid. I renounce the fear of intimidation, for Jesus said, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Hallelujah! I renounce the fear of false accusations. I accept this promise. Blessed are you when others revile you, and persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely. On my account, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Hallelujah! I renounce the fear of being treated unjustly. For of Jesus we read that when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. I renounce the fear of radical Islam and its desire to intimidate us. I renounce the fear of political correctness. I declare that the truth shall set me free, and I choose to live as a free person in Jesus Christ. And I speak about, and I shall speak, and not be silent. I renounce the fear of curses, either known or unknown, spoken against me and my family. I renounce the fear of manipulation and control. I renounce the fear of being involved in public or political activity. I declare that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. I submit to Jesus as Lord of every area of my life. Jesus Christ is Lord of my home. Jesus Christ is Lord of my relationships. Jesus Christ is Lord of my city. Jesus Christ is Lord of my nation. Jesus Christ is Lord above all false gods and religions. Jesus Christ is Lord over all the nations of the earth. I commit myself <coughs> to be a living witness to Jesus Christ as Lord. 
I'm not ashamed of his cross. God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of Christ. I ask now that you will fill me with your Holy Spirit and pour upon me all the blessings of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Grant me the grace to understand the truth of your word clearly and to apply it in every area of my life. Give me words of hope and life as you promised. Open and bless my lips so that I can speak to others with authority and power in Jesus' name. Give me the boldness to be a faithful witness for Christ. Give me a love for all people and a passion to share the love of Christ with them. Grant that I shall carry your cross as a badge of honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. And all I've got to say after that is Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. That's the end of our series. I haven't covered some major topics in there, as I said before, but what I have covered should be enough to get you started on your journey. God bless you as you study, continue to seek His coming. Continue to seek holiness in your life. Continue to seek Jesus above all. Not a religion, a person. What a wonderful person He is. He's been so good to me. I used to say this and I, I backed off because I wasn't sure that it was scriptural. I used to say, I've, since the day I found the Lord, I've been a happy man. That's the truth in, in general. My life was in the toilet before I found Jesus. I've got to tell you the truth. But since I found him, I've been a happy man. And then I found a scripture that said, happy is he whose God is the Lord. And I said, I'm back to saying happy, that's my testimony. So praise the Lord. God bless you, say. Eh? And uh, we'll start a new thing next week.